Hello everyone, and welcome to my General Hospital YouTube channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Today on General Hospital, Brooke Lynn tries to calm Chase down, Willow, Joss, and Michael talk about Jason, and Liz speaks with Aiden and Jake about Jason. Jason is in the PCPD interrogation room and has the jail blues. Chase phones Anna in the squad room, telling her to report to the station. Kates shows up out of nowhere. When Chase and Kates visit Jason, he informs them that he is giving up his right to counsel. Since his attorney isn't there, Chase believes it's a ruse to get off. Kates sees Chase off after telling him he'll handle things from here. What the hell are you doing here? He queries Jason while by himself. Chase is unhappy and concerned that Kates will make Jason a deal in the squad room. Brooke Lynn queries his needs. They head to the hospital because Chase wants to see Dante. Kates returns to the interrogation room and queries Jason's motivation for turning himself in. Jason clarifies to show that he did not shoot Dante. The evidence suggests otherwise, snaps Kate. When Kates inquires as to what transpired, Jason replies that he carried out all of the other gunman's instructions while he was on the roof, obstructing the shot, persuading him that they were running out of time to fire again, and abandoning the rifle. He claims that as they fled, Don pursued them and was shot by Hamish. Jason is informed by Kate's that Sonny was under video surveillance in the warehouse and that he was photographed, thus even before then, his cover had been compromised. Hamish is dead, Jason replies when Kate's inquires about him. Kate's insists on knowing everything that transpired before to Anna arriving. Jason clarifies that he shot Hamish after Hamish had shot Dante. He presumes the extraction crew took him away when they came seeking for him because he left his body where it was. Kate's must have anticipated his voice would be recognized when he dialed 911 in an attempt to assist Dante. Kate's queries why he ran and why he didn't call him. Jason claims Dant contacted 911 after seeing him and being able to identify him. He was unable to return to the extraction crew because they would have known he had shot Hamish. Again, Kate's admits he ought to have given him a call. After the pier, he asks himself where Jason went, and Jason points out the footbridge. When Kate's calls him out, he is aware that he went to Carly first. Jason claims he walked straight to the bridge, but Kate's claims he was bleeding, so if he wants to investigate Carly's apartment again, there will be evidence of him there. Jason isn't complying, Kate's tells him. He agreed to cooperate. Once more, Jason claims to have gone from the pier to the bridge. Why did he jump off the bridge back then, Kate's wonders. Jason believed that Kate's wouldn't want Anna and the neighborhood police involved. After jumping, Kate's wonders where he went and who looked after him. He requests for help, knowing that his bullet wound was sutured. Was it Diane who made the arrangements for him? He is aware that she has a track record of clearing convicts, but this time, she will have to work like a magician to save him. Kate's clarifies that since there is no sniper to blame, he is in danger of being charged with capital murder and facing life in jail if Dante dies. Dante is still alive, according to Jason, and he can heal. He had best hope Dan does, Kate's cautions. He is furious that they spent 2.5 years on this endeavor. His cover is now gone because they put him into this group. He tells Jason that the FBI will use its power to move forward if they don't receive the answers they need, and they both know he doesn't want that to happen. When Trina arrives to Bobby's, Joss is happy to see her. Trina says she came here to meet another person. Since Trina no longer resides in the dorms, Joss hasn't seen her since she split up with Dex, and it appears as though they are no longer friends. Where has Trina been, she queries. Trina claims that because Joss was going through a lot with Dex, she simply believed that she needed space. Though Trina claims her friend isn't fun to be around right now, Joss still misses her. Joss believes they can share a commiserating moment. Speaking candidly, Trina admits that she was also avoiding Jason since she knew how important he was to both her and her mother. It's unclear to Joss that this is about Jason. 
Trina queries whether the thought of Jason shooting her father ever crossed her mind. As the gunman was going for Sonny, and Jason would never shoot Sonny, according to Joss, Jason couldn't have done it. Maybe she doesn't know Jason as well Trina as she departs does. departs to meet Trina. her Aunt Stella after Michael seems to see Joss. Joss queries Michael about the situation. He claims to have Jason-related news. He alerts her to the fact that Jason brought himself in and that the story will soon be widely publicized. Joss notes that while knowing Dante's whereabouts and his survival is reassuring, Jason might be set up for murder should Don pass away. They enter the kitchen and continue their conversation regarding Jason. When their mother saw him, according to Joss, she didn't have much time to spend with Jason before Anna and Kate's arrived. When Joss inquires as to what Jason said to Diane, he responds that she merely told him about the allegations he is facing. Diane cautioned him against getting his hopes up that Jason would be granted bail. Since things are not looking good, Michael leaves to have a conversation with Willow. Stella meets Trina outside. Trina feels too unwell to go anywhere with anyone, so she believes they should call it quits. Stella is aware that she is grieving and experiencing loss, but in the coming weeks, her anguish will change. Trina says she feels primarily numb and that she hardly ever knows how she feels from one instant to the next. She experiences pain and rage as well, but mostly it feels like she is moving in a fog. She is merely going through the motions, cannot taste what she is eating, and doesn't give a damn about lunch. Stella wanted to meet her since she's been worried and feels like she's still in shock. Trina is informed by Stella that she doesn't have to and shouldn't suffer in quiet. Trina is not in the mood to talk about this, so she believes they should reschedule. Stella claims that her loved ones don't want her to be in pain all the time. Trina sobs, perhaps expressing her want to hold onto her intense love for Spencer and not let go of him. Stella gives her a hug and acknowledges that she believes clinging to the hurt would prolong his life. She claims that Spencer loved her as well, and that he wouldn't want her to suffer or for his memory to be clouded in sorrow. What if he was the one true love of Trina's life, she wonders. Trina is told by Stella that she has her entire life ahead of her and that she should keep an open mind to recovery while concentrating on the present. Trina is scared of her fury, therefore she's not sure if she can control it. Stella claims she has no one to target with her rage now that Esme's dead. Stella tells her that the anger will subside, but it hurts not having closure because they were unable to give Spencer a dignified funeral. She claims that attending a funeral encourages family members to unite and support one another. Trina is aware that while Spencer received a memorial, it wasn't sufficient. Stella advises that she figure out how to say farewell and remember on her own. Stella invites Joss to sit with her as she enters Bobby's and places an order for pie. Joss acknowledges that she worries about Trina and that she is now unsure of how to be a friend to her. Stella thinks Trina is a great friend, but she needs time to understand this, so she shouldn't rush her. Joss is aware of and recalls how, following Oscar's death, many people attempted to console her but were unable to do so. Trina is resilient, adds Stella, and she will find her way home. Trina visits the cemetery and greets Spencer at his tomb. Since he isn't present and the grave is merely a stand-in, she can't even name him Spencer. She acknowledges that she can't stop hoping to hear from him, telling her that this was a nightmare and he's okay. She is aware that daydreaming about unrealized goals is unhealthy for her. She does, however, enjoy being close to the lake since it is serene and gives her the impression that he is there. She feels as though she has vanished, yet even in the rain, it seems as though he is present she everywhere. her idealized in version of their time together in Paris, where they visit galleries, museums, and bistros for dinner. She claims that, in her imagination, they stroll through Paris hand in hand, while in reality, she is at Port Charles. She works at the gallery and lives at home. She is not enrolled in school. Even though painting hurts, it keeps her from missing him. She had to try saying goodbye to him, even though she doesn't want to. She is aware that she will also drown if she doesn't. 
Willow finds her iPad earlier and turns it over to Liz when she gets to the hospital, because Liz can't find it. Willow informs Liz that knowing Jason's back must be difficult for her family. Liz acknowledges that Jake is very temperamental and that her entire family is tense. Willow assures Liz that she is a good mother and is doing her best to manage the situation. Liz acknowledges that she shares Jake's anxiety and her need to know what's happening, but she is forced, like everyone else, to hold her breath and wait for word. When Chase and Brooke Lane get there, Chase is still nervous about Jason turning up at the station. He is heard by Willow and Liz in the background. Brooke Lynn informs Chase that he may not have all the information at this time and that Jason's tale may have more details. What does she think of it all? Chase asks. If Jason had shoot Dante, according to Brooke Lynn, at least he would have been civil enough to bring himself in. Willow follows Liz as she dashes off, forgetting her tablet once more. Willow doesn't want to eavesdrop, but Chase said the same thing to them both. As she tells Jake to keep an open mind, Liz is terrified and unsure of what to believe. Willow doesn't know Jason as well as she does, but she finds it hard to imagine Jason would shoot Dante since he is Sonny's kid and Michael's sibling. She adds her two cents and advises Liz to hold on to hope. Liz expresses gratitude and advises her to head home since her boys would shortly be returning from school. Willow hopes all goes well for her. Brooke Lynn is still making an effort to keep Chase composed elsewhere. For the sake of Dante and his family, Chase knows he cannot abandon ship. But he also feels compelled to investigate what transpired. Brooke Lynn considers herself fortunate to have him as a good man. Being with her feels fortunate to him. They choose to visit Dante. When Michael gets to Willow, he tells her what happened with Jason turning himself in, warning that he had to or face repercussions. Willow is merely relieved that Danny won't be involved anymore after surrendering himself in. Willow questions whether it's over, but Michael feels like it is. Michael claims that Jason would never give them up and that he probably gave himself up to keep them out of trouble. Willow is concerned about Liz, Jason, and his children. She adds Liz hopes she could tell them what they know because she's concerned about how all of this is impacting Jake. Michael asserts that they must wait for this to resolve itself. When Aiden and Jake get home from school, he cannot stop talking about bread beginnings. Liz shows up shortly. She overhears Jake yelling at Aiden, accusing him of trying to divert his attention in order to console him about his insane father. Thanks for watching if you like this video. So please don't forget to subscribe my channel and don't miss any updates.